Shom Rebyog. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the tiny room. Welcome back to On Shom Rebyog. I am in the physical tiny room, but I am joined by the man who is digitally in the tiny room. Tiny room. It's, it's digitally be- Benjamin. I'm going to give the listeners what they desire more than anything, and what they desire more than anything is an update on your surroundings. So I'd like to point out that this week you've covered up national hero Michael Collins with what appears to be a tasteful nude, probably probably done by yourself. It, it, it was Michael, well spotted. Um, well spotted there. Yes, Michael. Um, well, <clears throat> various circumstances this week came about where we're having a, a, a nationalist icon in, in the background of a of a room that I was in was, was probably not great. <laughs> Might not, might not send the right message, Ben. Benjamin, do you want to move on briefly? <laughs> the music for the podcast. We don't actually have anything music. Very good, very amusing. Benjamin. Yeah. You will be both surprised and delighted to learn this week that there is news. News, you say? News. What news, ben, boy? The news, exactly, exactly, Benjamin. But the news comes to us from a very cheap place. The first no. bit of news, <laughs> Ben, is uh, the release of the first bit of promotional material for the upcoming film by Denis Villeneuve. It's, it's the film June. Timothy Chalamet. Denis Villeneuve. Denis Villeneuve. Super French. Yes, Benjamin. One of your favourite uh, directors. Big old fan, Michael. Big old fan. He, he does a colour palais. He does. He loves a colour palais. Love to I stick to that s- colour palais. Judging by this, it looks like there'll be some uh, golden colour palais and some blue colour palais. Looks like some, some dark, murky green ocean palais as well. Oh, here yeah, and that's there. in the planet where they start. Um, of course, Ben, we're talking about the film Dune, or as friend of the podcast, Shane incorrectly calls it Dune. It's not Dune, it's June. June, yes, June. Dune. June, okay, yes. Dune. Dune, that's what I'll call it from now June. on. June, yes. Dune. Very good. Benjamin. Were you, uh, was your, was your palate wetted with these images? Did it, did it wet my whistle, so to speak? Yes, exactly. Um, yes, yes, it was, it was fairly wetted. Now, Michael, I'll, I'll be the first to admit here, Michael, I've not read the L Dune Dune. Dune. Dune, Dune, Dune. Dune. I'm going to, I'm going to do it all now. Um, I, I've not, I've not done an L reading of that. However. Maybe you should. I probably should. It's a, it's a big old hefty tome, Michael. We'll probably do an it's episode on it bad. before. I think uh, we have already before the movie. Yeah, but I can relook at it now because I've watched various videos on it, Michael, and why it's a sci-fi masterpiece, and I'm pretty interested in it now, Michael. Um, sci-fi masterpiece, Ben. They say. Yes, yeah, a very high concept sci-fi masterpiece. Probably the most thought-out world since J.R.R. Tolkien's. Every single blade of grass comes from a long line of blades of grass and has an individual name because a name very is good. your soul, and a blade of grass deserves a name because it's part of the ecology of the universe. And, and see, see that blade of grass over there. Which one? Secretly the king. Secretly the king. Hiding yeah. a big old blade of grass in his pocket yeah, that makes him known. the king. Should have known, Ben. Yeah, everyone is secretly the king. Everyone June is, is secret- very good, Ben. One of the things about this is the production design looks surprisingly similar to the David Lynch version from the late eighties, yeah, early nineties. I, I, Michael, would it be fair to say that we probably can't stray that far from it? And Denis Villeneuve well, probably understands that. Well, I don't know if it would be fair to say that, Ben, because the David Lynch vision of Dune was quite different from the book. Oh. Yeah. Was it a bit but weirder? The, yeah, well, the book is pretty damn weird anyway, but yes, it was It was plenty weird. Um, what what stu- stood out to me, Ben, from the images was that, for example, the still suits of the Fremen. Yeah, of course, the, the still suits of the... yeah. So the Fremen Ben are the people who live in the desert. <laughs> as if I didn't know that. <laughs> and as you know, Ben, Arrakis, the planet Dune, um, has very little water on it. Well, that's just Maracas for you. You know, that's that's Maracas. Arrakis, Arrakis. No, it's Maracas. Arrakis. Where they where it's... they shake the little things to make music all the time, and that's how they defend Mar- their land. That's the planet Maracas. <laughs> that's a different planet, Benjamin. Where they harvest that's one of the mo- they harvest huge the more amounts planets. of guacamole to enjoy. Oh, <laughs> no. That, that might be racist. Is Maybe this? you should pop that Michael ah, Collins picture back up. <laughs> um, Is that racist? Damn it. So anyway, what were we saying? Yes, the still suits, Ben. They wear special suits so that no piece, no bit of moisture escapes from their bodies. Good for them. Yeah. So that means probably, Ben, that... Um, oh, no. That what I'm saying is it looks... The still suits look quite similar. You see a still suit on a young Paul in the still images and on Zendaya. 
is Zendaya in this movie, Michael? Yeah, Zendaya's in it. Oh, sold, Michael. Oh, good. Sold. Well, at least you're still a creep. Um, <laughs> no, the... so from the point of view that she's actually quite a good actress and should be quite good oh, to see. Oh, right, 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 right. Relax, right. And your, relax. Your she's fa- a little too your young for me. Your favourite also is in it, Benjamin. Your favourite is in it also. Who's uh, my other favourite, Michael? I've got lots of favourites. Your other... You're the favourite. The, the the big fellow who goes, yeah, that guy. Oh, Jason, Jason, Mo- Jason Momoa. Ma- J- Jason Momoa's. Jason Samosas. Jason Momoa's in it. Jason Samosas, the guy who loves to have a drink on set. <laughs> um, He's, does he? No, he Is doesn't. That slander? He's quite a professional man. Quite a professional he man. He loves a Guinness. Loves a Guinness. Yeah, Often seen over here in this little Emerald Isle. Not at the moment, Michael, because all the pubs are closed. All the pubs are closed, Ben. But you know who else is here on this Emerald Isle at the moment, trapped with us? <laughs> Go on. It's bloody well Matt Damon. It's only Matt Damon. Um, and he's, uh, he's, he's tra- funnily enough, Ben, I've just realised that both of us today are dressed like Matt Damon. Yeah, we're doing the casual caught we're out the about. the casual Ma- Matt Damon look. Well, as you know, Michael, yourself and myself have been catapulted to what can only be described as superstardom, having started this podcast together. Um, and we can't really go about our daily lives without donning the, the tried and tested costume Rivaled only by the Marvel tried and tested incognito costume of a baseball cap and shades. Um, we're yes, wearing well, Matt hoodies. Damon. The we're, Matt Damon disguise. The Matt Damon disguise. was like, no one will recognize me because I have a hoodie on. Also, I'm Hollywood actor Matt Damon. Apparently, he's become trapped in Dawkey. I find that very amusing. He's marooned in Dawkey. <laughs> I mean, there are undoubtedly lots of famous people in Ireland, Ben. And some of them are more famous even than Matt Damon. Are they? But I don't know. Probably. But I, there's something that just tickles my whistle about Matt Damon being trapped in Dawkey and having to go to Super Quinn. I know, it's quite funny. He, apparently he opted for it. Yeah. Apparently he was like, nah, going to chill here. Go to Ireland. Going to chill in Dawkey. Going to chill here. Um, he there's was a fil- pub. There's a the super filming. value. He was filming in Dawkey. Um, mm. And someone has done a little a little poster, Michael. I don't know if you've seen this on, on the interwebs. Someone's did a little poster and it's called the uh, Get Him Home, The Mortion, starring Matt Damon. <laughs> because for those that don't know... Yeah, 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 I get it, I get it. Dawkey is famed for, for a particular accent, um, yes. which, which would be something akin to this here where you might say The Mortion. I went to see The Mortion in the cinema. Um, so they called it The Mortion. That's very funny. Yeah, it is, guess. It's probably not as funny because it's a visual joke, but you know. That's what podcasting yeah, yeah, is for, yeah. is slowly explaining what, visual gags. Yes, yes, yes. That's why we set this whole thing up. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, what's next, Michael? <laughs> <laughs> we're finished. We're finished talking about June, are we? <laughs> no, um, let's go back to June. Fremens. No, no, we're, no, no, we're done about June. We're Fremens about and June. guacamole. Yeah. Go on. And Oscar Isaac is in it. Oh, I love Oscar Isaac. And he has some armor on. Oh, looks pretty cool. Love a bit of armor. Gonna have to check looks those stills like out presu- again. <laughs> looks like good production design. Yeah, good for him. Will it be a success? Probably not. Denis Villeneuve. Will it be a good movie? Probably yes. Denis Villeneuve. Probably yes. <laughs> Commer- Probably not a success. Commercial Classic flop. Denis Villeneuve. <laughs> Great film. Flop. <laughs> yes. Now, Ben. Yes. Speaking of uh, Moon Knight. Yes, which we were just talking about. Who is famous for noticed? his Fremen suit. <laughs> Very good. Benjamin, they're making Moon Knight. It's still happening. Why? <laughs> Well, I don't know. I think our podcast inspired them. Yeah, that's what it is. We can't let those two boys down in Ireland. Can't can't let yeah. them down. This is for our but boys it, in Dublin. It's entering production. The damn thing is going to happen, Ben. Madness. Mad- Isn't it? Is it, though? Is it, Well, they say, this, they say November, so if the world hasn't apocalypsed by then, then I guess it is. It might have. Maybe it already has, Michael. Maybe it's just you and me in a fit of madness broadcasting to the airwaves of nothing. Well, how would that be different from any other week, Benjamin? <laughs> hey! Oh, this was a terrible venture between the two of us and has not paid off. <laughs> <laughs> Benjamin. Yeah. Speaking of terrible ventures, though, that have paid off. <laughs> did I see what I've done? That was excellent. We had a little Netflix a watch a party during oh, the week, didn't we, Ben? We did. W- Benjamin, without going immediately into either spoilers or your opinion. Why don't you tell us um, what what little Netflix watch party we had? <clears throat> well, Michael, as you know, yourself, yes. One, yes, one Jim friend of the podcast, one Shane friend of the podcast. Good friends of the podcast. And one, don't know how to pronounce June. Don't know how to pronounce June, apparently. Apparently it's an affliction that, mm-hmm. uh, that affects all friends of podcast. We must ask yes. Glop, can she pronounce it? Um, yes. uh, we, we, we have a little Wednesday night cinema tradition. Michael. We do. We but, did, Ben, before, you know, the bad times. Yeah, but because we're responsible adults, Michael, 
we don't have yes. that tradition anymore and not because also, the cinema the is open no 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 yeah. we yeah. took it as a moral responsibility we definitely think... wouldn't have gone to the cinema if they were still open <laughs> i think we actually did didn't we we didn't go see bloodshot for no, that we, very reason we could have but we didn't yeah. for yeah, sheer moral shit. responsibility um yeah, it was shit also was shit. Um, so we decided, Michael, to to kind of reignite the tradition, relight our fire, yes. so to speak, for, exactly for risque cinema choices. Mm-hmm. And we went uh, and we organized a little watching party on Netflix of Code Eight. Oh, um, sounds great! It it yeah yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to touch that. Um, <laughs> Benjamin, why don't you tell us what Code Eight is? Well, Michael, picture a world right where yeah, where there's right. where there's a group of people right. Yeah, and and society's not not too not too hot in them, Michael. Now, yeah, um, y- yeah. they wouldn't be the, the you know the bells of the ball now. Um, right, and then there's there's a man, and he gathers yeah. these he gathers these people together in a team, Michael, because he yeah. wants to protect them, right, and to help them look after themselves. You're just describing the X Men. I am, Michael, because that's all it really is, Michael. It's like that show that came out. What was it? Uh, the the bloody one the with uh, your man from the vampire show, the gifted. That was it, Michael. You're thinking of the gifted. I'm thinking of the gifted. It was basically the gifted without the family unit. It was pretty gas. Um, except that, Benjamin. Go on. T- you're telling us too much. Your opinion. Come on now, tell us what it is. Oh, I'm dreadfully sorry. Uh, my opinion is, Michael... Um, <laughs> no, don't tell us your opinion. <laughs> tell us what it is. Uh, Just tell us right. that it's a Netflix film from the brothers. Right, there's a young fella from the wrong side of the tracks, right? No, uh, don't tell us the plot. Uh, <laughs> All right, I'm like, doing what am I So, Benjamin, uh, Code 8 <laughs> is a Netflix-only superhero film. <laughs> I'm just taking the responsibility away from you here because you're just you've you've lost your listening and reading comprehension this week. Netflix have ordered this film, Ben. Yeah. It's a it's a superhero film. Yeah. Starring Robbie Amell. Yeah, famous. Have you ever heard of him? Uh, once or twice, I think he was a knockoff yeah. character in one of the Hunger Games, wasn't he? Uh, or was that I Liam Hemsworth? He I, don't I don't think he was in the Hunger Games. No, but he uh, he's famously Stephen Amell's cousin. Stephen Amell, who you'll remember. From playing John Arrow. You have failed this city. Yeah. Exactly. And so the the two boys, they created this short film a few years ago called Code 8, which is a, a film about superheroes in the real world. Ooh. <laughs> and uh, somehow it got made into a Netflix movie. Because... And somehow, Ben, it has become the watch, most watched thing on Netflix ever. <laughs> I, I, have to, I have to pin this on quarantine, Michael. It has right. to be people just working their way through the catalogue. And now they're like, well, it's new. I haven't seen it before. Stick it on. <laughs> is it? Is that why it's become so popular? Or is it because I would imagine Stephen Amell probably has a, a fair bit of Stephen CW has, clout. Stephen Amell has a following. Is Stephen Amell's following big enough to, to make everyone watch Code 8 on Netflix? No, but I think quarantine boredom is. Hmm. What a combination. But but Michael. Yes, Benjamin. Riddle me this. I will. We were sent but an article after watching it by one Shane friend of the podcast. Or was it Jim friend of the podcast? Shane I friend of the remember. podcast. Doesn't matter. Shane friend of the podcast. And uh, in that it said, well, it looks like it's bloody popular and we're going to be getting a sequel. And uh, Oh no. Yeah. Oh no, Michael. So would you like to explain <laughs> would you like to explain why that is your response? That usually chipper Michael who daren't say a bad word about a thing? I'll say a bad word about you. Yeah, no, well, that's different. I'm, I am, I am a subhuman thing. It's a whole <laughs> other level of thing. In yeah. fact, you'd probably be, uh, you'd probably be out of it if yeah. you didn't insult me, Michael. I'm yeah, worried yeah, about you weird. if you didn't insult me. That'd be weird. Yeah. Go on, tell us why you hated it. Well, I didn't hate it first of all. Oh, screw I you! No, I screw didn't. You. I definitely did hate it, but. It starts reasonably well. It's not too shabby. It's all right of a start because it's set in a world, Ben, where superheroes exist and it seems to be random mutations. Yes. Although the 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 first and initial and lasting disappointment with the damn thing for me was the genericness of superpowers. Yeah, because everybody has a there's a, there's a set set <laughs> yeah, of powers. There's strong people. There's electricity people, there's melty hand people. And there's fixie people. And there's fixie people. And that's fixie people, people to be it. 
Now, I mean, oh no, there's telekinetic people. Magnet people? Magnet people, bulletproof people. Oh yeah, there's Mr. Invulnerable, Mr. Bulletproof. Yeah, there's a, I mean, there's a wide range, there's te- psychic people, there's mind reading people, there's all the classics. Yeah, it's your, it's there's your, no really. it's a answer. grab bag of Stan Lee S- openers. Cla- basics though, Stan Lee basics. Yeah. Like the most basic powers. And it it's so disappointing that the lead character is an electricity man. That's it. And ele- electricity man is probably, to my mind, Ben, the most boring power. Why is that now, Michael? You're going to have to expand on that there theory. I've never seen a good electricity man. Have you not? No. If you remember, Ben, um, Mutant X, which we talked about a few weeks oh, ago. Oh, yeah, you gave that a bashing too. That had a mutant electricity man and he was a bore. Do you think that electricity, basically all the spark in their personality is in their hands? Uh, remember Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., Ben, one of your favourites? Yeah, my probably my top TV pick of all time, Michael. They had an electricity man called Lincoln and he was also boring. Do you know what I find fascinating, Michael? Is it, well, it's certainly not electricity, man. Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. has yet to finish... This to be yeah, a... it's uh, the season seven is coming out in May twenty third, I think. Sweet Christ! Yeah, no, it's never going to end. It's brilliant. It's great. Um, <laughs> Sorry, back so, to yeah. back, so, back to back to Sparky Hands McSparkerson. So yeah, electricity men are boring. That's the uh, first problem. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, fair enough. But well, I thought the the start of the film was quite intriguing because we lived in a world where there were super people. Yep. And they had entered industry yep. as like, do your electricity stuff, do your choppy things and work in this factory. But then post-industrialization, they've all ended up unemployed. And I thought, hmm, I've seen some of these ideas before, but not quite like this. This is a slightly new twist, which I'm enjoying. Yes, they were a shunned demographic, Michael. Yeah, but through finding themselves replaced by automation, which is not usually the way uh, kind of superpowers are phased out. But it does make a lot of sense because, I mean, so what you can generate electricity? Probably not as much as a nuclear power station. A bloody turbine. (laughs) Yeah, or, okay, you're very strong. You're probably not as strong as a hydraulic press. Almost definitely not. So I thought that was pretty interesting and pretty cool. The robots who drop from the sky, Ben, we talked about this a couple of times while we were watching it. There's robots Sentinels. Sent- no, they weren't called Sentinels. They were called Guardians. Sardines. 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 The Sardines, they drop out of their flying metal tins. I think this whole <laughs> series existed, Ben. Squeeze- they really squished in there. This whole series existed for that one image of two Sardines dropping from a flying metal tin. Ah, we've peaked. And Michael, landing on I'm the done. ground. That Sardine joke is a winner. I'm out. That's, I'm that's it. That's all that's we need. Wait, that's all we need. <laughs> The whole movie seemed to exist for that one visual. It did. Because that was the overall engaging visual of the movie. These two robot men dropping out of a ship, landing and killing everyone. Yep. That was the the coolest thing in it. They weren't even that scary. Well, they looked like Chappie. They did look awfully like Chappie. They looked a lot like Chappie, but if Chappie was played by a man in a big bulky suit. (laughs) By a man in a big bulky suit. And they weren't even that threatening. I, no, they got, I, they got beaten up pretty easily. Like one guy throws a weight at their heads and they just crumple. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Like, I don't, I didn't understand. But overall, Ben. Yeah. I think it was you, Ben. You called the film Mutant Heist in Canada. No, I didn't. I think somebody else did. I'd love to take. Okay, I think it was probably me. So, I mean, the that's what that's what it is. It's a mutant heist in Canada. It it might as well be set in the world of X Men. I think you'll find it's pronounced Canadia. Can, mutant heist in Canada. Yep, there we it go. might as well be set in the world of X Men for all the for all the difference it makes. It doesn't make any difference. Almost nothing. No, and uh, it's a very generic heist. Super generic, Michael. Yeah, uh, the the you know as as always, some of the characters don't survive the heist. Don't worry, it's only the ethnics though. All of the white guys are fine. Yeah, that was tricky, wasn't it? That was <laughs> that was an interesting choice. And you called that right off the bat, too. You're like, well, they're not going to make it. Uh, no, it was that kind of film, wasn't it? You know, the two brothers Amel are going to walk away from this. And their female friend and their, their uh, what was he, Jamaican friend, maybe? There's no way they're making it out of this. 
he was a mute, so we don't know, do we? It's impossible for us to know where he was from. Um, Canada, I guess. Uh, Canada, I guess. I mean, Michael, we were live texting this, and it was like watching a slow train wreck. It just slowly started to spiral out of nowhere. <laughs> and we were just, the tweets were steadily getting a bit more derogatory as we went along, and it was just like, wow. Wow. <laughs> it's just no it's just, like, it's just no good where is this coming had, from where did that come it from had, it had no ideas it started that making, was the biggest disappointment it started making some serious jumps towards the end there um, and I think look there's a there's a healer character here Margot um, and I think she's supposed to be initially kind of a a bonding character that bonds with with Sparky Hands McSparkerson yeah. Um and she's Healy Junkie Mick Healerson. Um yeah. and that's kind of she's I, it's she, nice to see you really paid attention, Ben. Yeah, she's a she's a fallen woman, Michael, in a certain way, I suppose. A fallen uh, woman. <laughs> she's a fallen oh, woman God, character. Ben. Don't Look, know if you should be saying that. I don't write bad scripts, Michael. I just have to watch them when you make me. Um and I think this was your idea. No, this no, it was not. <laughs> No. It certainly wasn't my idea. It was, it was it was Shane, friend of the podcast's idea. Oh, it was, I knew uh, it was Shane's idea. <laughs> Basically, um yes. they're supposed to have some kind of chemistry. She's supposed to be kind of his redeeming his his shining star in the distance. And Michael, two flatter performances you could not hope to find oh God, on a net. So flat. The whole thing is so flat. The, there are two the the movie has two ideas. It has two <laughs> ideas. Post-industrial treatment of mutants and the robots dropping from the ships. There, it's two ideas. That's all they need. Everything else, <laughs> everything else is so generic. Ben, you know, a great fan of Stephen Amell, am I? Huge fan. If Stephen Amell came along and said, "Hey, Mick, do you want to do a podcast together?" I would say, "Stephen Amell, we will get rid of Ben in a heartbeat. We'll get you in here, and we'll, we'll, it'll be great." Don't make promises you won't keep, Michael. <laughs> Don't make promises uh, you won't I'm, keep. I, I would I would love to be friends with Stephen Amell. I what I would give friends. to be released from the servitude of this podcast. <laughs> I tell but you, ben, the day you found me in a magic lamp, rubbed it and said, I wish you'd do a podcast with me, was the worst day of my eternal existence inside that goddamn <laughs> lamp. You're a bloody genie is what you're getting out there. Uh, yep. But this movie proves that Stephen Amell has one gear and the gear is Arrow. So serious. So he just played serious. Arrow. He just played John Arrow again. So heavy and serious and just tone deaf. He played Arrow but saying fuck. Yeah, he, he enjoyed that. You could see he was really <laughs> licking his lips when he got to unleash an L expletive. It was fun for yeah. him, I think. Yeah. After years of CW, CW censorship. CW now. Um, uh, like even the writing and motivations of the characters. Like we have one motivation for Sparky McSparkerson. Yeah, um, his mom is sick. His mom is sick. Classic working class, so he can't get a leg up in society because he and his He's mom are sick. Um, and then we have prejudice. Then we have kind of a weird Magneto esque Stephen Amell, who's like, "Oh, humans have never done anything for us. Take what you can get." Um, yeah, I'm Stephen Amell. Look at me. I'm so handsome. And it doesn't make any sense, Michael. He's just aggressively hitting that point again and again and again, yeah, and he bizarre. never learns. His it's bizarre. It's his a, actions. It's a bizarre film, ben. His actions lead to the death of the ethnics. Yeah, deathnics, if you will. <laughs> um, and he learns nothing. He just continues on the path he was on. That's yeah. He's still like look. He's still like fuck him. Fuck the humans. Look, Ben. Though I'm excited to see where the trust goes, and, and what happens in the next one. I'm no, not. I'm not either. I'm joking. You see, I'm joking. The least convincing sinister cabal I've ever seen. <laughs> Oh. It's just a lad in a Land Rover with a mildly grey suit. Um, yeah, that's, that's the trust. That's him. Um, Benjamin. Go on. Look, I, I can't in good conscience recommend it. No, neither can I. Uh, t- two out of two thumbs down from me. Two out of two. Congratulations, you're still fully thumbed. Still fully thumbed. <laughs> Although, Ben, in big news this week, uh, Stephen Amell is now no longer my ideal uh, celebrity friend. He's been replaced by Henry Cavill. That's fair. Look at him. Big Butch Henry. Henry Cavill, Ben, shares all my hobbies. God of the nerds. I wonder if he'd like to do a podcast. He probably would. Do you know what? Of all the times you've threatened to replace me, this is the only time I've felt a genuine kind of like, oh, oh, maybe. Uh Maybe. Uh, He likes Warhammer, Ben. He does. He loves a Warhammer. He likes jujitsu. He's bloody, bloody rolling around the floor with men. 
I know, I'm telling you, I think me and Henry Cavill would be good friends. All right, Henry, I'd call him, uh, I'd call him, uh, I'd call him, uh, I'd call him Henzo. Cavill. Uh, all right, the, Henzo. The Cavill. Mate, would do a jiu-jitsu and then paint some Warhammers together and he'd be like, oh yeah, Mick, we will, yeah. He's Australian in this. Yeah, okay. And, <laughs> and then he'd go, do you want to do a podcast, Henzo? And he'd be like, oh yeah, mate, let's do a fucking podcast. We'll fucking smash it, mate. Uh, and then I'd be just out there. And in good conscience, Michael, I probably couldn't argue with my replacement. A better yeah. Ben you could not hope to find than Henry He could Cavill. probably play you. I'd be Although in this case, we'd have to get his moustache digitally added. Yeah, and we'd also probably have to, you know, lop off his lower legs to make him anywhere near my height, Michael. He's a very yeah, big man. Yeah, he's quite tall. He's I don't a... think he's that big, Ben. I think you've fallen for the Hollywood trick of people appearing bigger than they are in real Michael, life. he's bloody huge in The Witcher. He's a big fella. He's a big fella, he's a but big he's probably fella. not as big as you think he is. I know he's a big fella. He's a big fella, but he wouldn't, for example, Ben, be anywhere near as big as our friend John. Uh, no, our friend John is very big. In fairness, he's, he's a big, big. That is a big fella. Saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's big. He's a big fella, but I mean, you meet people as big as Henry Cavill in your day to day life. Do I? Yeah, well, not, yeah. not at the minute, Michael. Not now. Not, not at the now. minute. No, now you're now you're in a house. You're trapped in a house with only I'm actually hero, Michael Collins, one of the relevantly me. tallest people in this house. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, what are we doing? What are we doing here, Benjamin? We were talking about the big fella. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, last week. Oh, very good. Was Michael <laughs> Collins, here's the question for the listeners, Ben. Was Michael Collins bigger than Henry Cavill? I would like to know the answer for that. And do you think he'd be good as a uh, bloody witcher? <laughs> as a witcher, probably. Um, what were we talking about, Ben? Go on. Yes, Ben. Last week, I told you I had watched a few videos and watched a few uh, reviews and done some reading about a very interesting film from this from the early 80s. Yes, Michael, it's become something of your obsession. It has a little bit. It became a bit of an obsession, you could say, Ben. Yeah, I just, I, I, I just did, Michael, you see. I, I beat yeah. you to that. Benjamin, have you ever heard of the film Alien? No. Well, uh, <laughs> no, that's, a <laughs> that's a conceit too far, Ben. <laughs> it's too far. I just did that because you wanted me to say yes and I took it away from you. Yeah, yes, well, Michael, okay, I have heard again. of the groundbreaking tumultuously well acclaimed film Alien by Ridley Scott yeah. yes Ridley Scott yeah and Fox Studios Ben you'll remember that when it first came out Ben it was kind of derided as a haunted house film in space yeah for, well I don't know why you derided Michael well people did Ben oh. that's the funny thing it was just considered kind of schlock and schlock. later on yeah exactly it beca- uh, one of those a basic haunted house film in space Strong as is words. often the case I know as is often the case when new genres are invented, people didn't get it at first. Hmm. What do you mean they but didn't Benjamin, get it, Michael? It wasn't very critically popular when it was released. But it's a haunted Alien. house movie in space, Michael. Exactly. Oh. It's excellent. But anyway, uh, critical failure though it was initially, now of course considered a genre classic, it was financially quite successful. Right. But Ben... The studio behind it were Fox. Have you ever heard of them? Um, uh, Don't do a conceit. Just say yes. Yes. Well known for being dodgy Fox, Ben. Dodgy Fox. <laughs> ah, very good. Mm. And with a bit of a creative, um, a bit of creative accounting, Ben, they managed to claim that the hundred million dollars or so that Alien made didn't make a profit. What? <laughs> yeah, because Ben, they didn't want to pay the production studio. What a bunch of a-holes. They do that quite often, Ben, do they? in Hollywood. They'll claim that, through for various reasons, a very successful movie has actually caught, made a loss so they don't have to pay out royalties or uh, residuals and, you know, that kind of thing. I think that's what happened with Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, isn't it? All the guys who played the turtles got royally screwed. <laughs> yeah, because they said it wasn't a success and they're like, but it made millions of dollars. And, and you made a sequel. <laughs> It did, but it wasn't a success. It cost us money. So anyway, that's what happened with Alien, Ben. Right. And and that left a bit of gap. because So they couldn't make a sequel. Ah. Because the studio who made it wouldn't make a sequel because Fox wouldn't pay them. Fair. Because Fox were claiming that the first one was a financial failure. So Alien had created a thirst, Ben, for horror in space. People Fair enough. wanted it. They were People wanted thirst in for it, Michael. Thirsty, thirsty exactly. alien lovers. And there was no better thirst quencher in the early 80s than uh, Hollywood's Roger Corman. I'm sure you've heard of him. I actually have. Oh, wait, no, wait. Did he do Did he do Iron Man suit in Iron Man 1? 
No. No, I'm the wrong guy. Go on. Roger I'll, I'll look him up there. Go on. You, you. Roger Corman is a B-movie pre- film producer, Ben. He's one of the most famous B-movie film producers of all time. That's weird because I he, like B-movies. He made very, very cheap, uh, quite exploitative, but very, very cheap films. And they made money. One of his most famous, Ben, was an unreleased Fantastic Four film from 1994. Oh, I know that? it. I know it well. Yeah, that fella. I know that well, fella. That fella. He, the big fella. He uh, he made a he made a rip off of Star Wars called Battle Beyond the Stars. I think it was called. He's still making B movies, Michael. Oh yeah, yeah. He's like, he's a very successful man. He doesn't. He just doesn't make big Hollywood blockbusters. He makes B movie knockoffs and cash grabs. Uh, yeah. But very successfully. Yeah. Anyway, he had the idea Ben of making an Aliens knockoff. Right. And he hired a director. He got a script. There's a whole story. You can follow this whole thing. We won't get into it, the, the very nitty gritty of it today. Uh-uh. But it ended up being called Galaxy of Terror. It wasn't called Galaxy of Terror when it was written or even when it was being filmed or when it was first released. But in the end, it was called Galaxy of Terror. Fair. And Galaxy of Terror uh, is a very, very low budget Roger Corman film. The most interesting thing about the budget, Ben, is the... The spaceship corridors were lined with McDonald's styrofoam boxes. No. Painted painted to look like technical gubbins. Oh, I like it. Very, very, very cheaply made. But it, because it was cheaply made, it had to be very practically made. Fair. Um so all of the effects obviously it was the it was the late seventies, early eighties. All of the effects were practical, puppets. Uh, special effects, matte painting, you know, all of that usual stuff. The classics. Yeah. And in the movie Galaxy of Terror, which I watched the other day, just a quick little, uh, a quick little, not a spoiler here, Ben, but a little quick warning. If you're going to watch this, there is a rape in it. Ah. Oh. Which is a shame. Ah. Oh. It's a great crying shame. Um, but it was an exploitation film from the early 80s. Yeah. And but, ah. Oh. Yeah, it is a it is a shame, and it's a monster rape too. Oh no! It, it's not a terribly graphic rape, and <laughs> it's also quite. I mean, it's not. It's a. <laughs> I, I I almost don't want to say this, but it's a rape designed to be titillating rather than oh, gross. Oh no! But anyway, look, oh, Michael, if you can boo. get over that. Yeah, no, it's not a it's not a good look. Boo to you! But it was for bringing this onto our <laughs> lovely podcast. <laughs> anyway, Ben, this film is about a crew, a crew on a spaceship, a gang of lads, a ga- and women. Very progressive. The captain of the ship is a woman. Ah, oh, good and for the her. Lead technician is a woman. Good for him. And the psychic is a woman. Good for them. It's about equal women and men. One of the crew, Ben, probably the most famous crew member for us today, is Robert England. Ah, oh, Freddie, a young Fredward, a young Fredward Kruger, a, fr- a young Fredward Kruger. Um, Go on. But what were we saying? So they get a they get a distress signal, Ben. Yeah. From a crashed ship on an alien planet. Oh, never a good thing. And they go to the alien planet. Oh, the planks. And when they arrive there, they are kind of sucked onto the planet by some sort of energy field that causes their ship to crash. Spooky. So they find the uh, they find the spaceship that they were sent there to rescue. Right. And there's supposed to be seven crew members and they find four of them dead. Oh, no. So the motley crew have to go and try and find the rest. The gang of lads. The gang, the gang, the rescue team. So they they put on their backpacks and they get their guns and they trek across this alien, this Geiger-esque alien landscape. Mm, Nice. And as they're trekking across it, Ben... They come across this ancient, terrifying pyramid. Is it phallic? No, it's not phallic. It's oh, pyramidal. Then it's not Geiger esque. It, it's kind of Geiger esque. Um, but Ben, the whole time you're watching this film, up until the gross bit with rape, which we'll stop talking about now, <laughs> you're thinking to yourself, "This does not look cheap." Oh, okay. It, it, it is. It is worth watching for the quality of the production design. Okay. And do you know why, Ben, the production design is so good looking? Because Ridley Scott gave them money. No, they had no money. Oh. But they hired a young 
up and coming production designer who was very cheap at the time called Jimmy C. Jimmy C. <laughs> exactly, Ben. <laughs> Get the fuck out of town. <laughs> so yeah. So they hired um young James Cameron. Get the fuck out of town. That's mad. I won't get out of town, Ben, but they hired young James Cameron basically as a prop maker. Gas. So he he was the one basically f- responsible for designing the pyramid and making the model of the pyramid and, you know, sticking the styrofoam on the walls. And But Jimmy C being Jimmy C, Ben, he basically took over <laughs> the entire production. Good man. So, when you watch the the movie, he's credited as production designer James Cameron. Right. But when you watch some of the behind the scenes stuff and read some of the articles about the production of the film, he basically took over. <laughs> he basically <laughs> ran the show. Classic Jimmy C. Classic Jimmy C. Swanning in, taking over, and making his uh, his own film. Um. So Ben, the the most interesting thing about this is, it's. An almost unknown film. Yeah, I've never heard of but it. But shot... Sh- exactly. Shot on a micro-budget. A rip-off of Alien. By Mr. Jimmy C. By Mr. Jimmy C. Who then took almost everything from this film. And then went and made the official Aliens to Aliens. So Jimmy C got a test run. Basically, this was Jimmy C's test run to make Aliens. This was Jimmy yes. C's Hollywood test run. That's hilarious. Uh, and if you watch it, there's so much of the DNA of Aliens wow. in this film. It's unbelievable. The The creepy location where they end up, the team, the motley team that are sent to get them. They even have these backpacks with torch lights over their shoulders which is the defining image of the Marines yeah. in, in the Colonial Marines in uh, in Aliens. Big gun, backpack, light. Big old light. Yeah. Walking across an alien landscape. Um, they flamethrower dead people. They It's it's the prototype for aliens. Oh, man. And it really is, um, that is quite interesting gas. to look at. It is. It's a very strange film. Also, Ben, it turns out that the alien pyramid is a children's, an alien children's toy. And it's designed to make people confront their worst fears. Okay, wait, so hang on. The the pyramid in the movie. Yeah. Okay. Is an alien child's toy. Yeah. Right. I thought what you were saying was... The pyramid in the movie effect. The effect no, no, of no, the pyramid no. in the movie no, was no. an alien child's toy no, from no. the first film. I was like, the actual pyramid, the evil pyramid, was designed by an alien race as a kind of children's game for their children to face their fears and overcome them. Well, that's fucked up. But uh, yeah, exactly. But these aliens were obviously more developed than us, and the humans can't face their fears and overcome them. So Aww. the humans all get killed by their fears. The little babies. Exactly. Uh, classic. Humans and are a primitive species. Exactly. It's a surprisingly good film. I mean, there are big editing problems in it. There are big plotting problems, pacing problems. It sounds like there's no ADR done on it whatsoever. Ah, sure. Why would you need ADR, huh? Well, because sometimes the sound effects are too loud and you can't hear the characters speak. That was a rhetorical question. ADR is I know, quite and I, an important I answered your rhetorical film. question. But... The the one thing that you have to say for it is mm. the production design is spectacular. Aww. It looks like it cost millions. That's pretty good. I'm gonna I'm gonna look up a few stills here. Just have a look. I, I would look up a few clips. I would even watch it, Ben. You you recommend watching this, Michael? Ten out of ten. I think you, two thumbs no, out of two uh, thumbs up would watch. No, no, absolutely not. Oh. One thumb up. Because there's a lot in it that's bad. Rape. It, there 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 is a there is a rape in it, which is not great. Not great. Um but there's also, for example, the Burt Reynolds type character. I, I don't know who the actor is who plays him, but uh, he comes on and he you would think that there would be some sort of inversion of a trope where he's not going to be the heroic one with no faults and who can do a flip. But he very much isn't, Ben. He is the golden god hero of the piece. Is that the official poster of the film? Yeah, that is nothing to do with the, <laughs> the film either. Amazing. 
In a classic 80s twist, the cover of the box and the poster have nothing to do it's with it. It's just to get bums on seats, Michael. That's it. And Ben, that's why the, the, the rape part was included. To get bums on seats? Yeah. Because it was, she was quite, the lady in it who is uh, raped by the monster is, was quite a famous kind of Skinamax actress at the time. Oh, God. Oh, okay. I, okay. There's a couple of images here that I really wish weren't here on the IMDb page. Which ones are those, man? Uh, it's a it's a young lady who looks like she probably starred in a few Skinamax films, and uh, <laughs> she doesn't look to be having a good time. Michael, I'll tell you that much. No, no, no. Well, she's getting killed by a giant worm. Yeah, but the looks of things, yeah. <laughs> but look, a brush over that for the moment and watch a version of it with that cut out if you want. I, I might because. Because the the just for the production design, there there's a character in it. Ben, go on, uh, and he's the youngest rookie member of the squad. I'm trying to find and him here in the stills. Is it is it he, Freddie England? No, he actually stay young Fredward Kruger. He actually lasts most of the film with Fredward Kruger. Oh, good for him. Um, but the young panicky guy Ben. Oh, it's a classic. Yeah, it, it, well, it is a classic. It and would be if me. You think who. Hmm? It would be me <laughs> if they were to make a If you think, film. Ben, who, who is the most famous, like, who's one of the most famous young panicky guys of all time? It's probably from Jimmy Cameron's Aliens. Yeah. That's it, man. Game over, man. Game over, They're man. just animals. They're in the ceiling, man. Yeah, it's classic. And, Ben, young Jimmy C met young Bill Paxton on the set of this For film. Sake. <laughs> See what I'm saying? This is the DNA of aliens, is what you're saying. Aliens 2. Uh, not only aliens, though, Ben. Because young Jimmy C. Ben, one of the people working on this film, was uh, his name was Al Apone. And Al Apone is the leader of the Marines in Aliens. I don't know if you know that. But Jimmy C. also met working on this film, Lance Henriksen. Get the... the, the, the what? It's, this, this film is the genesis of Jimmy C.'s film career. It's pretty impressive. Michael, how it did, really is. How did you find out about this? I have been watching a lot of YouTube videos on old movies while I'm at home. Yeah, bloody quarantine, Basically. Michael. You find all kinds yeah. of new things to do. There's a couple of uh, there's a couple of good channels. There's a there's a YouTube channel called Good Bad Flicks. I think I've heard of that one. Yeah, they they did a very good video on it. There's another guy called Brandon. Brandon Brandon's B movies reviews or something okay. like that, and they both go into it obviously a lot longer than we have time to do, but both of those are worth watching after you've watched the film because it's great to find out all of these little bits of information. So watch the film first, skip over the no. the, the icky bits that probably aren't mm-hmm. great. There's only there's only one icky bit. That's it. Just just the That's Uno. It. Yeah, yeah. Taffy O'Connell was that the name of the poor young one who gets? Is that well, the Skinner Max young one? According to, uh, uh, apparently what was, ha- apparently what happened was they promised, they promised the investors right. uh, someone getting killed by a giant worm and they promised the investors a sex scene and then the script didn't have room for both and someone suggested merging them. Oh, Jesus fucking Christ. And apparently uh, she was the one who said, yeah, let's do it. Right, I, I'm. I'm gonna I, look, uh, Michael. I'm just gonna stop you there, very, very quickly, right? right? Yeah. Because I've come across Taffy O'Connell, or yeah, Taffy yeah. O'Connell, <laughs> and I'm on the IMDb page for this movie, Michael. Yeah, and I'm, I'm just gonna read you the first, um, the first couple of lines from her biography. Go on, because they made me laugh my ass off. Gorgeously buxom and curvaceous blonde bombshell, Taffy O'Connell oh, ben, the was born into an upper class family on May 14th, 1951 in Providence, Rhode Island. I, I just, uh, Michael, that's just the best opening line to a biography I've ever ben, seen. It was the 70s. It was the I'll 70s. Write, w- wait until I write your biography. <laughs> oh, I hope um, you put the word buxom Ben Colby in. Anyway, yeah. I'm all it's, for It's that. a very interesting movie. Am I saying it's a good movie, Ben? I am very much not saying it's a good movie. No, you're probably not, Michael. It's... But it's worth watching for the production design and for seeing the kind of genesis of such an influential figure as um, as Jimmy C. In, in, in yeah. our favourite genres. Yeah. Sure look. Sure listen. Sure look, that sounds, look it. Michael, this is one of the most interesting podcast episodes we've ever done. Oh, what an accident. I am, I know, <laughs> what a shock. Um, I am so intrigued by this film that I am genuinely going to make that my evening viewing. 
Yeah, well, there's some there's some not great things about it. Don't forget. I, I know, but I'm I, I think it's morbid fascination, Michael. That's that's drawing. Well, a me bit in of morbid here. fascination, but always bear in mind. Just watch the shots. Even some of the shots are shot for shot shots from aliens. Shot for shot shots, huh? Yeah, and this came out before Aliens. It's very important to remember, Benjamin. So that kind of inspired me to think, Michael. I we should just there... leave it here. We've peaked. There's no way we can top this. <laughs> I was thinking, and this is so tenuous, but I was thinking, are there any other films out there? Are there any other films out there which kind of pre... Is there a ghost behind you or is that someone in your, from your family washed out by the brightness? Uh, it's probably a ghost. Oh, uh, classic ghost. Probably ghosts. a ghost. I Look, I live in a big spooky house, Michael. Um, in space? It's a big spooky house in space. Um, however, however, you'll be pleased yes. to note, pad rape. Um, oh, there's no rape in my house in space um, But anyway Michael Tenuous Tenuous grasping at straws um, So here's the tenuous on. link one. That got me thinking Got the old brain a were, there an, were there any other films Which had a big idea Which had been preempted By a less popular film Before them Yes And it probably happens All the bloody time Yes um, Like the likes of Memento Maybe someone did that before Memento. Not quite as well. I think this is probably even more likely today, Michael, whereupon small YouTube creators back in the day would have made a short film and then a couple of the uh, snippety snapped up or something like that, you know? Well, well, yeah, I mean, that's slightly different where someone takes a good idea like the short Lights Out. Yeah. Ugh. And makes it into a not quite as good long film. So creepy. Short Lights film. Out, Mama. Mama. Ooh. You know, there's a lot, <laughs> there's a lot of that. But I'm thinking, like, has ever a film come out which a few years before that had a much lower budget, much uh, less popular, uh, kind of predecessor, and not even necessarily. Anyway, Ben, I watched The Sorcerer's Apprentice because I thought it was like a, a predecessor to Doctor Strange. I think it really is. Um. Yeah. I, okay. So to to give people a lowdown on The Sorcerer's Apprentice, 2010. Cast your mind back. Cast it all the way back. Uh, bloody Nick Cage is still at the height of his Hollywood power. Um, <laughs> much of which is dwindled these days. But he's still at the height of his thing. He still has a, 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 a smidgen, a crumb yeah. of his sex appeal left. So they, they, give, they give Nick Cage a sex appeal. It's last hurrah. They throw him in a big old leather trench coat. They muss his hair up with some mousse. And uh, yeah. then you, you pick the up and come hot young comedic actor. And Jay Parachel gets a gets a gets his big moment to shine in a full on Disney production, and that is the Sorcerer's Apprentice. Now, Michael, what in God's name is the Sorcerer's Apprentice? Uh, well, to be honest, Michael, not a whole lot. It was originally a little <laughs> short from Fantasia, where uh, yeah. bloody Mickey Mouse is a Sorcerer's Apprentice. <laughs> It's actually pretty good. Um, and Michael, he's a he's a young hotshot mouse apprentice, and he tries to be a, a lazy a lazy son of a gun. And he tries to get magic to do all his housework for him, but Michael, you can't do that because magic isn't a shortcut to real life. Um, even though it definitely would be if it was around. Definitely would be. Definitely would be. Um, and it, it blows up in his face, and uh, somebody somewhere said, "Look, we have Nick Cage. We need a movie. He wants to do something with magic." Uh, magic. That's what he said. Magic. I want to wave my hands and do magic. Um, and they were like, "Okay, yeah, cool." Uh, just do you see that little five-minute clip there? Turn that into a make film. that into a film. Um, and they do, and they do, and they get a pretty stellar cast. Michael Alfred Molina. Alfred Molina's in it, playing a baddie as a villain. Yeah, is he Mortimer? Is that his name? Mordred, Horvar. something like that. Hard of our okay. Anyway. Uh, and Michael, what what ensues is a is a is a two thousand year Merlin conspiracy, yeah, um, and the hunt for the prime Merlinian. I know, so stupid. It's basically um, it's basically Doctor Strange combined with what Americans would prefer Harry Potter to be like. But great special effects and magic scenes, Michael. There is more magic in this. And this is where this all came from. There's more magic in the opening scenes of this than there is in probably. The entirety of the first Doctor Strange film. Yes, definitely. the The first Doctor Strange people film is all bloody hand shields and whips, and they don't rely on any of that in the Sorcerer's Apprentice. They kind of just make it as whatever Nick Cage wants, he gets. 
Yeah, they do telekinesis. They do electricity bolts. They do fire. Tesla. They do pushing, pushing people into mirrors. There's all kinds they of do, things. They uh, do changing people into Monica Bellucci. Monica Bellucci. There's all Monica Bellucci is essentially not in it. Arthurian legend. Two lines. The the Arthurian legend thing can shag off. And the prime, <laughs> Mer- and the prime Merlinian is one of the stupidest things I've ever heard spoken it's out loud. Also, on, no on way it would be Jay Baruchel in New York. That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> yeah, I mean Jay Baruchel, and he talks like that, and he's so obviously Canadian. He's like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, guys. Oh, oh man, I, I just used. Oh man, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, oh I, hope I just so. needed to impress that girl. Oh, I hope so. Um, yeah, bizarre, bizarre for. One of my favourite lores ever. You get a real sense that magic has been around for a really long time in this film because there's all kinds of haunted objects and cursed artefacts. And, just and it's great. Whipping out magic left, right, and centre. great. They definitely went on a stroll through New York with Nick Cage, and Nick Cage was yeah. like, I want to ride an magic eagle. on that. <laughs> I'm going to magic on that thing. Can you get Where me? Where are we going? Go- I've gone more towards Trump than Nicolas Cage. <laughs> Can you get me a Ferrari? Can I go through a window? Yeah. <laughs> And that's that's what it was but from start to finish. It's a surprisingly finish. good film. Yeah, it's incredibly enjoyable, despite yeah. the fact I think it's enjoyable based on the performances of all those people. The, the uh, women are poorly served in it. Well, Morgana, you mean the 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 five minutes of screen time shared by Monica Bellucci and Morgan Le Fay, then coupled with. And even, even Teresa Palmer, I think is her name, playing uh, Becky or Becca, his love interest. That was... Who has no... She has no character other than inexplicably liking Jay Baruchel. Inexplicably. Inexplicably and like unbreakably. He does some pretty dicky things by mistake. And she's like, you thought that would make me not like you? Oh, you thought that would make me not like you? I'll oh, always you like that, you. I'll always inexplicably like you because the plot demands it. Because you, but, you drew King Kong... On the Empire State uh, Building, yeah. on a bus window. So the funniest thing for me about that film, Ben, is I have a very good friend called Dave. Go on. And I think everybody does. I, I but don't, but go on. They say Dave a lot. Dave. Yeah, they're like, what are you doing here, Dave? <laughs> oh, that's ah! my dog. <laughs> my dog's having a moment. Your dog wants to be called Dave. <laughs> no, she wants nothing to do with Dave. What are you doing here, Dave? <laughs> anyway, Ben, tenuous a link as it was. The Sorcerer's Repentance is quite good, but I don't think it was Doctor Strange before Doctor Strange. Little, little, uh, little, little fun fact about me: I would much rather watch Doctor Strange with Nicolas Cage as Doctor Strange. I think was was he ever once potentially in the picture for that? I think Nicolas Cage has once been potentially in the picture for just about everything. Especially Superman. Especially Superman. Superman if you take a look at our Instagram, which because I, I misunderstood the topic this week. <laughs> Classic Ben. Classic Ben. That is sadly becoming a classic Ben. Uh, anything else there, Michael? Or would, would you like to call no, us I think today? we're. I think we're bloody done, Ben. Bloody up a time, Michael. We're up a time. Ladies and gentlemen, what other ones do you know of? And and which ones do you think make us slightly better? So there's going to be a sound of two rushing people because my dog has gone running in there. My sister is running after it to look after it so that it doesn't bark during our podcast because my family's great. Um, so uh, what I was saying is, Michael... Bloody let us know, listeners, what what you thought was a better version of something before it was something. Well, there's a yeah, succ- exactly. There's a succinct sentence for you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, go watch Galaxy of Terror. Skip over that nasty bit and tell us what you thought. Um, and then... <laughs> my dog is just I can hear screaming. <laughs> Is there a galaxy of terror in the background? (laughs) Ladies and gentlemen, you can get in touch with us in a number of different places. Do like a traditional web model, then go to our bloody website, www.shomrabeog.com, S-E-O-M-R-A-B-E-A-G.com. It means tiny room in Irish. It does indeed. Or perhaps you're one of those millennials or Gen Zers and you fancy a little bit of a more hip application way to go about things. Head on over to Instagram and find us at shomrabeog, S-E-O-M-R-A-B-E-A-G. Still means tiny room in Irish. No dot com because you're hip and young. Uh, and ladies and gentlemen, do you have anything on the podcast that you'd like to hear covered? Get in touch with us on either of those locations. Or if you're listening to us on Apple Podcasts, do give us a review. You can top down what you'd like to hear in the little comment that you leave us to give us a review. Uh, are you listening to us on Spotify? Give us an L follow there. 
give us an old follow and uh, share it on your Instagram story so more and more people can hear our, our, our frankly mediocre ramblings about uh, films that you've never heard of. Um, and then, ladies and gentlemen, if you're on YouTube, hi, inexplicably listening to the podcast on YouTube. Um, hi, Nisha. Hi, <laughs> Nisha. Um, and yeah, get in touch with us there. You can leave us a comment down below. That's it for this week, ladies and gentlemen. If you haven't had enough of us this week, you can check us out this very Wednesday when we are dropping Wednesday. a new collecting issues where we're reviewing the 19. 19- 98 uh, uh, cult hit in the Inhumans from Paul Jenkins and Jay Lee. 1998. Is it? Yeah, 1998. Uh, that's it from us, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, talk to you next week. Bye. Bye. <laughs>